Good morning, everybody. Just while we're waiting, can I encourage you to log on to this uh, website, which will allow you to vote at the beginning? So uh, just get yourselves up and running on that, can you? Is that it? Is that what? It's invisible. Are you guys allowed to vote? Let's squeeze it another five minutes. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Nick Gowing, and uh, this is designed as a debate which you can get involved in because we want to know your point of view both before and at the end of the debate. And it is about smart jobs and the impact on the labor force. And we're going to have a debate which is known where I come from as a kind of Oxford style debate. And um, that's what we're going to do this morning uh, with uh, a number of participants. And let me introduce uh, our participants here this morning. And for those of you who've just come in, if you could just log on to that uh, website address there, um, wef.ch slash robojobs, not jabs, robojobs, then um, I can get a sense from you in a moment of what your thinking uh, is on the motion that we have before us this morning. We're going to be doing this for no more than one hour. And don't leave before the end, please, because I want to know if you've changed your point of view. And if you're not in the room, I can't actually know whether you have changed your point of view. Um, so uh, let me introduce uh, our participants this morning, both for uh, and against. Um, against the motion, 
Uh, we have just we have uh, uh, we have two speakers. First of all, we have um, uh, Jose Manuel Salazar. Welcome. Uh, you are the Assistant Director General for Policy International Labour Organization, formerly the Minister for Foreign Trade in Costa Rica. Welcome. And against the motion as well is Lord Adair Turner. Welcome, Adair, um, who is currently Senior Fellow at the Institute for New Economic Thinking in the United Kingdom and relevant to this discussion is that he was chair of what in Britain is called the Low Pay Commission, uh, which uh, sets uh, payment um, for uh, workers uh, at a certain level in the market. Speaking for the motion, and I'll tell you what the motion is uh, in a moment, is Justin Cassell, welcome, uh, who is uh, the director of Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. And you may notice, actually, that there's one person missing at the moment uh, who hasn't yet quite arrived. But I'd like to introduce, um, coming in, here he is, <laughs> Eric Grimmels. <Ooh. laughs> <Oops, oops. laughs> because this Ouch. is about smart jobs <laughs> and smart work. Welcome, Eric. Uh, Eric is joining us from MIT. Um, Eric uh, is the director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy. Notice he's checked in with a badge. Uh, because he's not wearing a tie, I insisted that the, uh, the arrival should be accompanied by a tie. Welcome, Eric. Can you hear us? Thank you, Dick. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Right. He will be looking in your direction as well. Um, but, Eric, um, I want to, uh, first of all, uh, thank you. And turn around and face the people behind you as well to show that you are a fully mobile, smart worker. There you are. That's Eric in MIT at the moment. Now, the debate is about smart machines uh, will make workers better off. So we have those for the motion and those against the motion. I'd like now to know what you are thinking at the moment. Are smart machines making workers better off? Can you go on your tablet or your iPad or uh, whatever you've got and just vote with whatever you can see? And I'll give you that result in a moment. The motion is smart machines will make workers better off. Can you vote now, please? And we'll see that result in a moment. Let me help you. Um, form of view, because we're talking about economists arguing in the past that technological innovation would serve us all. Individual workers may suffer, but new and usually better uses are found for the workforce as a whole. And um, history largely supports the claim, according to McKinsey's, the Global Institute, all but one 10-year rolling period since 1929 has recorded increases in both US productivity and employment. But in the aftermath of the economic crisis, unemployment remains stubbornly high in many countries. So technology, technology improving, what is the Im uh, impact on smart jobs and jobs? Uh, are the jobs better ones? They, they don't always seem to be better ones. And the gap in the US between average income and media hourly wages has grown since the 1970s. So again, that question about smart machines liberating our labor force, or do they leave us unemployed? That motion is smart machines will make workers better off. Have you all voted, please? Can we see the result, please? Do we have it? What are you thinking at the moment? Is it coming? Yes or no, Adele? OK, there it is. Eric, I'm not sure you can see it, so I'm going to read it all. The motion is that smart machines will make workers better off. Agreeing, 61%. Disagreeing, 39%. So at the moment, you have a fair win behind you, but you've got 39% of those in this room to convince with your argument. So the rules of the game are this, that each 
of the four speakers has no more than five minutes to put their case. First four, then against, then four and against, and then all of you in the room have a chance to offer your thoughts about this motion, speaking for no more than a minute each. So, Eric, from MIT, we can see you, we can hear you. You have five minutes to speak for the motion. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Golding, fellow debaters, honored guests. It is my great pleasure and honor to be here, even if only via robot. I'm here to argue for the motion, smart machines make workers better off. You know, 200 years ago in 1814, the Luddites smashed the weaving machines because they thought that they would hurt workers. And a surprising number of people who should have known better agreed with them back then. This was the supreme irony because there's only been one force in history that has consistently improved a lot of workers, and that is technology. Today, despite 200 years of history and lessons, some people continue to make the same mistake, even the same mistake, even here in the heart of China, where more people have been lifted out of poverty at a faster rate than even during the Industrial Revolution. And they've been lifted out of poverty because of the power of technology. The motion before us is smart machines can make work, will make workers better off. Note that the motion does not say it will instantly liberate all workers or that there won't be some bumps and setbacks along the way, but the question is ultimately whether workers will be made better off. And the answer is yes. Let me explain why. For thousands of years, most workers were literally slaves or serfs. That was the opposite of better off. Living standards were stagnant year after year, decade after decade, century after century, and then something remarkable happened. In 1780, living standards began to improve, and soon they were growing exponentially, doubling every 35 years, eightfold every century. And today, the average worker is 100 times richer than his ancestors were 230 years ago. As an economist, I consider this the most remarkable thing in history and the best thing for workers in human history. And why did it happen? One word, technology. In other words, better machines. The Nobel Prize winner, Bob Solo, showed that it was not by working harder that workers improved their lots, or from the kindness of kings or emperors or bosses or capitalists that workers' lots improved. The reason their lots improved was because of technology. Now, the technology of the Industrial Revolution mainly overcame the limitations of our muscles. First, the steam engine, and then other technologies like the internal combustion engine and electricity. Today, a new wave of technologies is doing the same thing for our minds. Computers, software, big data, machine learning, they're unleashing incredible intellectual power. Andrew McAfee and I call this the second machine age. And it is creating a new inflection point in human history, every bit as important as the Industrial Revolution that liberated so many workers. Today, productivity, wealth, and GDP are all at record highs. They've never been better. Poverty rates have fallen faster in the past 20 years than ever before. And there's a real chance that in the next 20 years, they will completely eliminate severe poverty worldwide. Think how remarkable that is. What's more, there are enormous benefits that don't show up in the official economic statistics. I'm curious, how many people in this room have some kind of a GPS device that they use that gives them turn-by-turn -turn driving directions? Please raise your hands if you have such a device. GPS. A GPS. I would say, Eric, Not look, with you, but looking okay. around, if you can hear me, that. almost everyone is uh, saying almost yes. Almost everyone. And how many people had a device like that 10 years ago? No hands have got, uh, one hand has gone Nobody? up. Nobody? Oh, whoa. Not even two. one. Okay. Maybe one over there. No. Okay, yeah, sure. Justine and does. Also Justine. Yeah. And why is that possible? It's because technology has improved so much, and we now have those devices built in for free in our smartphones. Um, and they don't even count as part of the improvements in GDP because they're given to us virtually for free. Not only that, but phones can now help diagnose cancer. You can take pictures of dangerous moles, um, and they are providing benefits in all sorts of other dimensions. There's a, a technology called CPAP that diagnoses cancer better than uh, human diagnosticians. There are now 
self-driving cars, and within a decade, they will be widespread on roads. They will help eliminate 1.2 million auto deaths per year, including up to 200,000 of them here in China. Now, has the path always been smooth? Of course not. It's been very bumpy. There have been depressions, recessions, and setbacks. But the today, better off than the kings or robber barons of a century ago. Now, the last 10 years, in fairness, have been especially tough. We've had a very bad recession worldwide. And as I wrote in my own book, The Second Machine Age, in the earlier book, Race Against the Machine, median incomes fell and employment population ratio fell. Smart machines have helped millions, but they haven't repealed the business cycle. But that's because work, uh, the full benefits of technology require changes in our institutions. In the Industrial Revolution, we invented public education and the income tax. Today, we're going to have to reinvent education and create new income support systems like guaranteed basic income. Technology can make the pie bigger. It can liberate workers. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has in history. I believe the arc of history is long and it bends towards better lives. And the best hope by far for workers is more and better technology like smart machines. Thank you very much. Eric, thank you. So there, ladies and gentlemen, you've uh, heard the first voice for the motion with a very clear underscoring of uh, the value of technology to creating jobs. Jose Manuel Salazar, uh, you're speaking against the motion. The floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Going and fellow uh, panelists and dear participants. I agree with a lot of what Mr. Bill Johnson has said um, and has said also in his books that smart machines are creating a new technological and industrial revolution and boosting productivity in many sectors, that this industrial revolution is completely different uh, from past ones uh, and that we live in an age of exponential technologies and it is only actually the beginning that this change is happening across a very broad front and also that the defining characteristic now is that uh, while the first machine is substituting for human muscle, the present one is based on computers and that um, increasingly use abilities that used to be uh, uniquely human. And of course, we are all excited uh, by the innovations and the promise of the brave new world of smart machines. But there are also very strong downsides. Uh, if you look into the economics of the acceleration of um, technology, I see a dashboard full of red lights and needles moving in the wrong direction. Uh, problem number one is that productivity increases are very heterogeneous uh, between sectors and between countries, with some sectors experiencing dramatic productivity increases and some countries, of course, being leading uh, leaders in productivity, while in many other sectors and countries, productivity is stagnant. So productivity increases brought about by the smart machines are not lifting all boats equally. In fact, many of them are lagging behind. Problem number two is that smart machines are massively substituting uh, for workers and are therefore aggravating unemployment. True, technological change complements the work of many workers, but these are mostly the high-skilled workers. Uh, and in the big picture of things, they are the minority. If you are an unskilled worker <coughs> or a worker engaged in routine work, easily automated, you will not be complemented. You will be substituted and your job will be terminated. And as you very well know, the vast majority of workers in the world today are unskilled workers doing routine work. Now, this is not to deny that new jobs will be created by the new technological revolution. It is happening all around us. But they will not be nearly enough anytime soon to absorb the large masses of unskilled workers, particularly if you think also of the new generations coming and look at the levels of youth unemployment in the world. For instance, think that the whole smart machine phenomenon in Bangalore, India, has created around one million jobs while the large majority of India's labor force of more than 600 million people live in poverty and will not join the smart machine revolution anytime soon. Think also that out of the around 600,000 workers needed to produce Apple products in the world, only 60,000 are direct Apple employees, mostly highly skilled in the United States. Most of the 600,000 are in China and by the way, they are rapidly being substituted by robots. 
recent research from Oxford concluded that 47% of total U.S. employment, that is around half of the U.S. labor force, is at risk of being substituted for machines. So this time is really different. Job destruction is advancing much faster than job creation. In fact, this is the major factor behind the so-called great decoupling between growth and jobs. Uh, Lord Turner is going to refer, uh, I think, to job polarization and other downsides. Uh, let me finish by saying that even for the skilled workers, the promise is not necessarily an utopian paradise. There will be lousy jobs also for some of them. The boundaries between work and life, and between public life and private life, will continue to dissolve, thanks to the smart machines. It is true that the new technologies offer new possibilities of working from home or from more convenient locations. They also offer more autonomy over how working time is organized. And a whole new world of online marketplaces is emerging. And all of this can be liberating or, or make many people better off. But there are also downsides. The new ICT uh, technologies allow work anytime and anywhere but they can also result in workers working at every time and everywhere. In fact, I think you ask for <laughs> smart uh, phones to be turned off now, but these are just short periods. There is also evidence that workers who telework on a regular basis work longer hours and have more frequently changing work schedules. So even for the high skilled and the privileged, new technologies pose important challenges for work quality and work life balance. So what I'm saying is that the new industrial revolution will bring good and bad effects on labor markets, but that the good will be concentrated on a few, while the bad will be widely spread. The rising tide of technology is not going to make everybody better off. Left alone, and this is very important, left alone, the outcome will be a small minority of huge winners and a vast number of losers. Of course, we can talk about policies that can mitigate and try to compensate some of the strengths but what I'm saying is the trend of technological impact itself is uh, full of these uh, uh, negative uh, uh, impacts. And it is better to uh, reason and to see and recognize this uh, to devise uh, appropriate policy responses from governments, enterprises, and individuals. Thank you. Jose Manuel Saladar, the first voice against the motion. So uh, we've heard two voices, for and against. Let's hear the second voices, the seconders uh, of this motion. Uh, let me introduce now Justine Kessel, who is Director of Human Computer Interaction, uh, the institute there at Carnegie Mellon. A reminder that some of you can contribute as well after we've heard these four opening speeches. Justine, the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you very much. I agree with some of what Jose has said, and, um, and I'm going to come back to that notion. But I, I want to remind the audience that while we've heard from two economists, I'm here to speak as a technologist. And this notion of smart machine has, until this point in the debate, gone unexamined. But we have an example of the kind of smart machine that my colleague suggests is going to uniformly destroy jobs. Here is the best, the newest, the most important smart machine. Now, um, it's, it, it, it has in fact liberated the workers already. Eric was able to stay in Boston and join us here at the same time. It also almost caused the machine to um, lose all of its abilities, uh, destroying thousands of dollars worth of equipment because it wasn't able to get on a stage. And so, in some sense, I could really rest my case, because if this is the smart machine that's going to take away our jobs, we really don't need to worry so much. It's a joke amongst roboticists that while there is widespread fear about a robot revolution, really all anybody need do is stand in the middle of a puddle, because when the robot approaches the puddle, it'll short circuit, and that'll be the end of the revolution. So I think we need to take apart this notion of smart machines and also take um, seriously where the fear comes from. At every World Economic Forum event that I've been invited to for the last four years, I've been asked to speak to the fears of robots taking our jobs, the fears of a robot revolution, of them destroying our lives. And to my mind, that comes from um, a kind of xenophobia, a kind of fear of the other 
that is somewhat like us and somewhat not like us. It's a very old vision. It's an unexamined vision, and it's been unexamined for a very long time. Remember that in the short story, The Sandman, more than 100 years ago, it was argued that automata, those figures that are around this tall and run by clockworks, were going to become so similar to humans in their aspect and their behavior that men would no longer be able to tell if their wives were human or clockwork machines. That vision hasn't come to pass, and I don't think that this vision is going to come to pass either. I also think that at this point in the debate, we need to examine the contrary of this motion, the opposite. That is, will smart machines make workers worse off? If we believe that that's a concrete possibility, then we should stop developing them right now. And you could all help by turning off your computers and your smartphones. But you can't, and you haven't been able to in any session that I've sat through. So we don't really seem to have much of a choice. We don't have a future without smart machines because we're on that path. We do, however, have a choice as to what those smart machines are going to be. Norbert Wiener had the same fear in the 1940s. Norbert Wiener, who's the father of cybernetics, a faculty member at MIT, in 1949 wrote a letter to the head of the Car Makers Labor Union in Detroit. It's an extraordinary letter, and I have it here afterwards for anyone who'd like to look at it. He said, um, if our only standard is profit, automation will lead us to levels of economic disruption that will make the Great Depression seem a pleasant joke. He wrote this in 1949. Of course, the 1950s and the 1960s saw unparalleled economic advantage and not economic disruption that made the Great Depression seem a pleasant joke. Today, again, we see economists, and in fact, Eric has really argued both sides of the equation, but Eric himself, as well as economists like Sachs and Kotlikoff, have suggested that one of the ways that smart machines are going to destroy the quality of life of labor is to depress the salary of laborers so supremely that they can't invest in better jobs. They can't invest in the retraining or the education that will result in better jobs. However, that analysis was done before, in the last year or 18 months, new kinds of educational technology have offered free education to virtually everybody in the world. And so I think the most disruptive smart machine that we have in front of us is the MOOC, the massive online open course. Now the MOOC in its current instantiation is by no means perfect, but it is open. So I would say that as in the past, where film strips in the classroom were introduced to educate returning soldiers after the, the Second World War, where computers in the classroom were a result of vocational training to retrain after technological disruption, MOOCs today are going to allow workers to retrain for jobs that do afford a better quality of life. As Eric has argued, when jobs, when machines substitute for muscles, we need jobs that stimulate brains. Um, as a technologist, finally, I have to argue that we have a choice. Technologies don't construct themselves, and they won't. It is our job as citizens, and certainly as technologists, to vote for really what constitutes smart technologies in artificial intelligence today, which is technologies that collaborate with people. Those of you who attended the Robot Revolution talk just a couple of days ago heard Manuela Veloso talk about the newest generation of robot. That is a robot that collaborates with people. Crowdsourcing is another example, reCAPTCHA, that at the same time gives us security for websites and puts old manuscripts online. Uh, Eterna, that folds proteins and plays games with children. So I would summarize by saying that um, only if we allow the development of truly smart machines, if we don't turn off our cell phones and our computers, but we allow what really is 
the development of a better smart machine? Will we truly liberate workers? Will we make them better off? Thank you. Thank you, Justine. Uh, so we've now heard uh, two voices for the motion and one against. And the second voice against the motion is Lord Adair Turner. Adair Turner, the floor is yours. Imagine that uh, 25 years ago, somebody had managed to discover some magic words. And those magic words enabled you to say, abracadabra, John, one, two, three. And you were talking to John at the other end of the world. What would be the economic impact of that? Well, provided the inventor was clever enough to make sure they got the intellectual property right, she would end up as the richest person in the world. Her intellectual property lawyers would be pretty rich as well, and her party, good party organizers and her luxury good providers. And she would probably employ lots and lots of people uh, cleaning her house and looking after her garden. But as I have described it, there would be nobody else actually involved in the process of mobile telephony, because if I've described it, it's, it's complete magic. Now, modern information and communication technology is not complete magic, but it is such a powerful technology that it is far closer to it than the technologies of the electromechanical age. We are able to create enormous amounts of economic value with extraordinary few people. When General Motors was the biggest company on earth, it employed a million people. Microsoft only employs 100,000, Google only 50,000, Facebook only 6,000. These are drops in the ocean of the labor market of the world. Now, ECT, ICT has two extraordinary features. The doubling of the fundamental productivity of the hardware every two years and the zero marginal cost of the replication of software. That's what makes it unique, and Eric has, has written about that. I believe that that has enormous positive potential for humanity, but we will have to have interventions to make sure all share in it, because left to itself, this is going to have a very unequal result. I am not worried about a lack of jobs. I think if you have flexible labor markets and flexible real wages, you will create jobs. But I think it is very important to realize that the jobs that are going to grow are not in the high-tech areas themselves. They are in what I call the high-touch areas, everything that you can't automate. Look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics forecast for the next 10 years of jobs. There is a list of 30 of what are the big categories of job creation. Only one of those Software and applications development is <coughs> remotely high-tech, plus 140,000. The big quantities are in personal care aids, home health aids, janitors and cleaners, maids and housekeeping, food preparation, and service workers. In total, in the American economy, there are less than 4 million people in total in all computer and IT and maths-related occupations. There are 23 million in the combination of food preparation, buildings, uh, maintenance and cleaning, and personal care aids. That's where the jobs will come from, because that's inevitable. We automate away manufacturing. We automate away clerical tasks. We only need a small number of people to be the very clever people who create the applications and the jobs. Everybody else will get jobs, but the crucial issue is at what wage rate? Now, Eric argued that in the long run, and he's right, eventually technology makes us richer. But it can be the very long run. There are economic historians who have suggested, and I think they have a good argument, that if you look at the whole of the first half of the 19th century, 1800 to 1850, British workers in the Industrial Revolution, the early Industrial Revolution, received no increase in real wages for 50 years. Indeed, many of them received a reduction. So yes, there were Luddites, Eric, but actually those weavers, they were worse off. And all of the return went to capital and skilled labor. The impact of technologies is not the same. It depends upon the particular nature of the technology, the pace of technology, the marginal cost, and the fixed cost. It depends on the nature of the elasticity of substitution of capital and labor. It depends on the complementarity of skilled labor uh, with capital. It varies over time. And there is something about this particular technology which I think is more likely than previous technologies to have an unequalizing effect. I think that's absolutely clear 
at the top. Facebook, a company worth $170 billion. As best I can work out, the actual technology base of that was created by 5,000 software engineer man years. I can't work out, or women years. I can't work out there was any more man years went into Facebook uh, than that. That is very small compared with what had to go into building Ford's factories before he could produce the Model T Ford. And that's because the, the thing is so powerful, and as a result, it gives enormous returns at the top end of the distribution because of network externality effect. At the bottom end, as we have extreme pace of automation, as we create jobs in low-paid, uh, what are currently low-paid sectors, because all of the sectors that I mentioned earlier have an average rate of pay of about twenty to $25,000 in the US, whereas on average those software application developers are getting $75,000. That's where the jobs are growing. For the last 20 years, not just, Eric, in the business cycle, but as you well know, I think, as you yourself say, for 25 years as a secular development, not a cyclical development, there has been no real wage increase for the bottom quarter of the US population. I'm not worried about jobs. I'm not afraid of the machines. I think we can make this positive, but I think we will have to try very hard with things like minimum wages and minimum income guarantees to make sure that this cornucopia of technology does not lead to a very significant increase in inequality. Adair Turner, thank you very much indeed. So, everybody, you've heard um, the voices for and against very rich arguments. And uh, for those of you who were here at the beginning, you'll know that uh, two-thirds of those in the room at the time do agree with the motion that smart machines will make workers better off. We've got about 20 minutes to run, and uh, for those of you who might be tempted to leave beforehand, I will ask you at the end to vote so we can get a sense of whether um, the vote has been swung either way or views have been swung either way by those uh, who've been speaking for and against the motion. I'd like to put a one-minute um, cap on any interventions from the floor. Who'd like to come in at this point, please? Did you want to? Yes, Austin. Behind me. Now turn to your left. Smart, Eric. There you are. <laughs> Um, my name is Austin Okere. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Computer Warehouse Group in Nigeria and a visiting professor at uh, Columbia Business School in New York. Uh, I, I listened to, I, I missed part of Eric's, but uh, I listened to Jose, and I, I think that there, there is a, a contrary uh, dashboard signals to what you pointed out. For instance, we listened to uh, Premier Lee Kei Chang, and he told us that there's been 10 million jobs created in the past eight months. Uh, when you say job created, it is taking job losses and job created and taking the, the difference. So that's 10 million. In Nigeria, uh, e-commerce has increased jobs by 1.2% in the last year on the back of broadband and ability to shop online and so on. In the US, job unemployment has gone down steadily for the past six years, uh, at least since the beginning of the uh, Obama administration. And for me, it's like comparing the fact that we will have nothing to do because email has made it easier to communicate than writing manual letters, or that the internet has made going through big cyclopedias much easier. And thus, in that sense, you worry about what are we going to do with all the time? Do we have all the time, even with email and, and the internet? No, we still don't have much time. So I don't think that we're going to lose jobs. So which, which way are you voting? I'm voting for. And Lord Turner says that uh, jobs will come from high-touch areas. And I, agree, I can't agree more. Uh, anything you cannot auto automate. What you cannot automate is creativity. And everybody has creativity. So you can't really uh, substitute jobs as much as technology seems to do so is going to rather increase jobs. Thank you, Austin. Right, please, across directly behind you. Each of the speakers will be allowed a minute at the end to respond to some of these interventions. Again, we have about 20 minutes to run, please. Thank you. Um, Anushka Vijay Singha with the Global Shapers Community of the WEF um, from the Colombo Hub in Sri Which Lanka. Which way are you voting? Um, exactly. I haven't decided yet, and maybe by in the next 10 or so minutes, I might swing either way. Uh, two, I two. want you to swing one way or the other. That's <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> it, it might depend on the, the responses to these points I'm about to raise. I think the first is, um, a Nobel Prize winning economy, labor economist uh, Dale Mortensen uh, showed that 
post uh, the recession, particularly in the US, a lot of the, the job loss has been this middle skill and this job polarization. Now, that was a result of the recession and the leaning of uh, um, trimming down of the fat in the, uh, in, in the US and not necessarily because of technology. So I guess my, the point that I'm trying to get your views on is, is it technology leading to a polarization of jobs or is it just the economics of it leading to um, certain skills going uh, becoming redundant and needing to find automated solutions for it. The second point I'm trying to make, I, did, I didn't quite hear, hear this coming out both from the technologists and from the economists in the room. Uh, we might see an era where through this collaboration between robots and humans where folks who didn't have certain skills are able to enhance their skills because of robotics, because of exoskeletons on them and they didn't have this, they're having more strength than they used to or, most, or different skills because of en robotic enhancements. So I just want to get uh, both sides' opinion on, on that and I haven't yet decided which way I'm voting. Thank you. All right, thank you. Who, let, who else would like to come in, please? At the back, uh, lady there. Uh, if you turn a little bit to your right again, Eric. Uh, turn round uh, to the lady there. Hi, Eric, it's Manuela. <laughs> I know him. Okay, so I actually think that this discussion is uh, very interesting and we are very lucky to have people that care about jobs talk with people that care about technology. But in some sense, what I think that the discussion could be uh, better going forward is that what is the solution yeah. in some sense? Uh, so there is something in technology that we call a Markov system. A Markov system means that we are in some state and we don't care how we got there, and we assume that state and only think about actions towards some type of like reward. So we are always in the business of deciding for the future. So what I'm saying is like this, I said this several times, we know this, it's inevitable. Justine said, Eric knows, it, the, the, the computers are here, the robots will be here tomorrow. This is all going to happen the same way that if we think about the telephone operators, remember that every single telephone call required someone to switch manually an input to an output like with these cords, and then there was a software switch, the hardware switch. Nobody thought about like, okay, we are not going to have a mechanical switch because we are going to take the jobs of all these operators it was not, not even conceivable from a technology point of view. We are at the same stage. It's not conceivable to have a policy that will cut the development of robots, intelligence in machines. It's just inconceivable that this would be a policy. So what I think that maybe not now that we have only 15 minutes, but the discussion that we should all engage is that like a conditional probability, given that this is the case, that we are going to have these machines, I completely agree with the, the goal of trying to see if we can actually not um, unbalance so much the outcome of this technology in terms of, rich, of, of the poverty or riches in the world. I mean, that's true. But that's true about many things too. The moment we do fish farms, we take jobs of the real fishermen. I mean, it's, so we face this question over and over. Right, well, let me ask you, uh, what, which way are you voting on smart Always machines for will the make workers better off? For the smart machine, for the motion, <laughs> inevitably, because that's what this is all about. Thank yes. you. Yes. Right, any other interventions? The gentleman at the front, uh, to your right, Eric, uh, not too far, back again. Smart Hi. Eric, there you are, he's standing up. Hi, Lucian Tarnowski uh, from Brave New Talent. I live in San Francisco. And um, just side point, I'm the topic champion here for employment and skills. So there's a debate going online, both on Twitter and uh, also on the forum's top link. So please do join if you've got other thoughts. Which way is it going, that debate? So um, <laughs> the, on, on Twitter, I think it's pro-machines. On, on top link, we'll wait to see. Um, my, my, I'm pro-machines, but I'm pro-machines with a caveat. And that's that I think what we need to do is use smart technology to be, better apply human capital. I think still human capital is the most wasted resource on the planet. And therefore, there's a huge opportunity for us to leverage technology to better apply human capital. I'd love to ask if there's any thoughts about what you're seeing. You've said MOOCs, but I think MOOCs are actually at risk of being, to reference George Orwell, the, the, the animal farm of education. They, they had a lot of promise, but actually they haven't lived up to it because all the research is showing the people that actually graduate are, are people that already have a degree. So what, what are you seeing from a technology perspective that can democratize access to education 
and in doing so, create more of a meritocracy around opportunity. Thank you very much indeed. That's a wonderful phrase, the MOOCs, the animal farm of education. Who else would like to come in at this stage? Anyone he here? Uh, Scott Hansen. There's a silent um, other uh, um, person sitting at the back there. There's another machine from Suitable Technologies. Uh, we've got, you've got the microphone now, uh, Scott. Uh, you've been listening to this debate. You have a minute to offer your thoughts on this motion that smart machines will make workers better off. Go. Well, I, have, I guess, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, so I, I have a slightly different wording or understanding of the question. And uh, what you said was, we'll make workers uh, better. I believe that um, work is not essential to um, humanity. So I actually voted no, they, it was not going to make workers better because I think work is going to go away as a, as a thing to do. So because machines are basically going to do all the work for us. So, um, so that's my, my comment. So uh, can I just check, which way are you voting? Smart machines yeah, voted, will make workers better off. I, I say I voted no because there aren't going to be any workers left. They're all going to go away, and it's just going to be people. Does that make sense? All right. Well, We're we can have a debate about work and jobs, work but uh, we don't have a lot of time for that, work or jobs. Anyone else? Thank you. Indeed, Scott. Anyone else want to come in, please? Uh, otherwise, the debate will continue between those uh, here. Anyone else? You must have strong views, some of you. Please, behind me. Uh, microphone behind, and if you uh, look behind me, uh, Eric, I will get up yep. so you can see the, uh, okay. the gentleman yep. speaking. You. Please, yeah. go ahead, Michael. Uh, Michael Marquardt, I work for BlackRock. You know, and we spend a lot of time day in and day out automating processes, and you can really see the difference of jobs going away from processing and moving into that higher value where human intelligence is really valued and, and the leverage of computing. But the real worry I have is in the short term of the dislocation and the, the gap in skills and the potential for that dislocation to lead to uh, social problems and violence. And long term, I'm a huge proponent, but it's that short term dislocation that I think is the real issue. So Michael, which way would you vote? Smart machines will make workers better off? Uh, long term, yes. How long is long term? 20 years. OK, thank you. Anyone else want to come in, please? At the front here, uh, half uh, quarter turn to your right, smart Eric. Right, so I'm Sri Subramanian from Bristol University. I'm not, a, I'm not an economist. I'm a technologist. I work in the same area as human-computer interaction. But one thing that made me wonder was uh, better off should be surely about social well-being and happiness of people. It's not clear to me just because you're working in a high-skill job you are necessarily happy. So that issue was never addressed in this forum. And I'm, I can see what you're going to ask me, which way am I going? Uh, as a technologist, I feel I have to say I'm for the motion, but I, I'm not convinced yet. Probably, I'm leaning towards a no as well. Yeah. All right. I, I'm intrigued, of course, about the use of your, your, your word happy, yeah. workers being happy. What is happiness in work? But that's, again, for another, for another session, not for this session at all. Right, anyone else, please? Gentlemen here. Over here, Thank Eric. You. Uh, Richard Jefferson, a social entrepreneur in the agriculture sector, uh, and in some ways speaking for the several billion people that never show up, uh, either at Davos, at any other World Economic Forum uh, venue, uh, who are in fact workers, very, very hard, very poorly compensated, and very poorly educated. In other words, the majority of the world. Uh, these people work in fields that can easily be automated. I can envision the automation of agriculture rendering several hundred million Indians uh, unemployed and a very large number of Chinese and some small number of Iowans have already gone this way. Now, are the workers better off when they have no alternatives or have we got an inelastic problem here? Uh, should this question have been promoted uh, 200 years ago when the population of the earth was dramatically less, uh, then we would have a different outcome. But now we have a problem with the inability to absorb these two or three billion people into productive income generating or pride generating activities, which we have actually not discussed. And this general, the last intervention is very important. What does it mean better off? A sense of purpose, a sense of value? I strongly vote no. And the word happy? Very important. 
That's a sense of value, Nick. It's a matter of do you feel your, your life is worthwhile, you're contributing to your community. That is a key part of being a human being. Thank you very much. Any more interventions, please? The lady at the front, uh, just to your right, Eric. Okay, uh, I'm from Taiwan, I'm a reporter. Um, my point is, um, whether you like it or not, we can't stop the develop development. Uh, the most important thing is we have, to, uh, we have to reform our tax system to make sure losers are not always losers for generation. That's my point. Thank you very much indeed. Anyone else want to come in quickly before I close the floor? One here uh, to your left, uh, Eric, uh, Victor here, uh, with the microphone coming in your direction. Soon, microphones will be handed out by a machine. Thank you. Victor Ponaretos, EPFL in Switzerland. I'm a professor of math there. Um, I think we, are, we might be confounding, I think, two issues. And one thing is whether it's inevitable and whether we should stop it. This was posed as a dilemma. And I'm strongly against that. It's not inevitable. It, it is inevitable. We should not stop it. It's human nature to pursue science and technology. And it's another thing to somehow negotiate whether or not it will make workers better off or not. And I think. I would say no, but it would not make them better off in the short run. And in the long run, it very likely will, as it has. How long the yeah. long run will be, it's very difficult to predict. But, but is the long run going to be much shorter than we expect? Very hard to say. At least I can't. But I think that it would be a mistake to somehow be trapped in the dilemma of whether or not we should stop it if we agree that workers will not be better off. Right. We can sure. agree that workers will not be better off, but still think that we shouldn't stop it. In fact, we should promote it. So do you have a clear view of which way you vote? I will vote workers will not be better off because I take the answer to be, I take the question to be in the context of the short run, not the long run. Right. Anyone else? One, one more intervention, please. Please, here. Uh, yes, uh, Tony Abrahams. I'm a young global leader and social entrepreneur from Australia. Uh, and my, I vote for the motion and uh, with the perspective of people with disability in particular. One in five people have a disability and uh, technology has enabled people with disability over the last several decades to participate in ways that would never have been possible before. Uh, and I think this is a vast untapped labour force. Good. Here, here. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Right, I think we heard uh, Eric say, here, here. Um, thank you very much indeed, Eric. Right, I'm going to close the floor because time is marching on. Before I ask for the one-minute summaries in reverse order from each of the speakers, can I ask all of you to get up your, the website again, wefwef.ch slash robojobs. Uh, we'll be coming back to that in a moment, and you can see the address at the top of the screen uh, on each of the... Uh, walls around this auditorium. Right, a minute now for each of the speakers to summarise and to respond. In reverse order, Adair Turner against the motion. You're about to vote. You're not voting on a motion about whether you're pro or anti-technology. I am pro-machines, I'm pro-technology, I'm pro-technological progress. I'm not about to launch on that machine and destroy it like a Luddite. I think it is wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, the things that we are achieving. They are an expression of human ingenuity. We can never hold back ingenuity. And they have an extraordinary ability to deal with things like disability, etc. But they will not naturally raise all boats together. They will not. And that is because this technology itself is so powerful in its doubling of productivity every two years and in its zero cost of software replication, it is more powerful than the chemical, the electromechanical age, the great, uh, or the period of the steam age. This is, I think, this third or fourth industrial revolution is going to be the most powerful of all. But it is going to drive inequality. Very few people are going to have high-value, high-tech jobs. The vast majority of jobs are going to be in high-touch high personal service jobs. We will have to intervene significantly to make sure that all workers are better off. We have the ability to do so, but it will require very significant public policy interventions. It will not occur naturally. Lord Adair Turner, thank you very much indeed for the motion. Justine Cassell, who reminded us of what happens to a robot when it gets to a puddle. <laughs> so we've heard that jobs aren't at risk, and I've been convinced of that. And we've heard that smart machines are here to stay, and I'm convinced of that as well. We've heard that smart machines can bring with them higher value jobs, higher creativity jobs, and higher touch jobs. And I want to stay there for a moment. Because higher touch 
can be high touch jobs, can be low paying jobs, or they can be higher paying jobs. And smart machines can play a role in that. My own work, and I've saved this for the end, is in the social infrastructure of work and the social infrastructure of learning and how smart machines can enhance that social infrastructure. So in fact, I've argued quite forcefully against the MOOCs of today and for something like a MOOC of tomorrow where rapport among students is what carries learning forward. And that rapport is enhanced by a machine that can mediate amongst people who otherwise might have intercultural difficulties, who might otherwise never meet a kind of education that most people have no access to today. An example that I'm very fond of is a group of seamstresses in Bangalore. They were uh, child laborers. They're part of a child labor organization. They're paid pennies for everything they sew. But they went online and they took a design course at a computer in the wall site, a free computer. They went online. They taught themselves design. They built a cooperative and now They've hired the entire village, older and younger, to design, to create, to be creative, to use the parts of themselves that are self-actualizing, and thereby, through the possibility of smart machines, to go into the future better off because they have acquired dignity. I think that's something that smart machines can give us, and thereby make workers better off. Justin Cassell, thank you very much indeed. Uh, the second voice, uh, or the first voice, uh, originally uh, against the motion, uh, Jose Manuel, uh, the floor is yours. And I remind you that Lord Adair Turner said you're not voting about technology. And you said earlier there's a dashboard full of red lights and it's moving in the wrong direction. Yes, and I still I stand very much by that statement. But I agree that starting point is to clarify this is not... Uh, arguing for jobs versus arguing for the machines. I totally agree. This is a great revolution to be welcome. It will continue. It's inevitable. Congratulations to all the technologists and professors working on robotics and all of that. Uh, in the long term, it would improve many lives. But what I think we are arguing here, um, <coughs> the point about the needles in the wrong direction, is let's be realistic. Let's not get overexcited or hype uh, uh, this because the impacts are going to be very strong. The adjustments are going to be uh, uh, massive. And this is a huge challenge uh, for policymakers, uh, not just policymakers, for societies, for everybody uh, to discuss what we have to do, even as individuals, because the burden of reskilling, of being employable, and so on, also falls off in the, on individuals. So I think it's very important to recognize that uh, we are, and, and uh, this, thank you very much, Eric and your colleagues, in a world of exponential technologies, that this time is different, that time is accelerating, but things are going to speed up. This is all, the, you, uh, we should recognize that. What I'm pessimistic about is the capacity of societies to be up to the challenge and to respond, societies and institutions. Unfortunately, you can make a list of all sorts of things that would be good ideas. But will we, as a human race, let's put it in this broad brush, have the capacity to respond, to put in place the right policies, etc.? This is the problem. So if we don't have the capacity, then the net outcome is going to be negative. Now, this is not a call to go and smash machines. It's a call to put in place the right policies. Thank you, Jose Manuel. Uh, so the last voice against the motion, smart machines will make workers better off. Let's now get the last voice for the motion, Eric in MIT, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Smart machines will make workers better off. The last minute is for you. Thank you, Nick. You know, we all agree on most of the issues. We agree that machines are creating unprecedented wealth. We also agree that we haven't done as much good as we should be in taking advantage of the technology. There are plenty of red lights in the dashboard. But here is the difference. I believe the fault lies not in smart machines, but in dumb decisions. I don't blame technology for whatever shortfalls we have. Instead, I hold our leaders accountable and I hold ourselves accountable. Technology makes the pie bigger. We all agree on that. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever really has. But technology is not a force that acts on its own. Technology is a tool. The real question is not what technology will do to us, is whether we will use that technology to create shared prosperity. We are fortunate now to have a more powerful tool than ever before. Lord Turner said it's almost like magic. 
creating enormous wealth with very little work? My God, that should be great news. That's exactly what we want technology to do. Shame on us if we don't use this powerful tool to create shared prosperity. How we divide the unprecedented bounty by technology is not decided by machines, it's decided by people. It is a social choice, and it depends on our education policy, our tax policy, our health and welfare policy, and the great wealth provided by technology only makes it easier to make improvements in all those areas. If you want to blame the machines for our problems, then go ahead and vote for the other side. I think machines are just a tool, and we humans will ultimately choose prosperity, just as we always have in the past, and Lord Turner says we will in the long run. We will, try, will we try to try as hard as he said? Of course we will, but that's never stopped us before. If you agree that we the people and not machines will ultimately decide our future, then you must vote for the motion. Right, that's the moment to vote. Eric, thank you. Um, let me ask you, uh, those of you in the room, to use your smartphone or tablet or whichever smart machine you have. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't unfortunately put up your hand because it won't be registered. So I'm going to ask you just quickly, if you can, use that website and say yes or no for or against the motion. And then quickly we can compare it with uh, what those of you in the room at the time were thinking when we started this debate. Are the votes coming in? I'm not going to summarize the debate. Don't leave the room, please, because otherwise it'll distort uh, the outcome. And Scott is actually, uh, the chief executive is now turning to the wall to see which way the motion is going. I will report it to you as well in a moment, Eric. Do we have uh, votes Thanks. there, please, Adele? Right. I think it's going to be punched up. There we are. Against the motion. Ah. Mm. Well, Ooh. against the motion, 53%. Uh, and for the mo Hang on. Oh, What's oh, going oh, on? Oh, 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 oh. oh. <laughs> I'm not sure what the credibility of this vote is. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Keep voting. <laughs> this is people still voting, yeah. Do we have stability? Oh, 51 Do we have, Is someone voting multiple times here? <laughs> right. Does I've the got, technology stop them voting multiple times? Yes, it Good. does. <laughs> I've, got, I've got to tell you, this is a beta test of a principle here, and I think we need to do a little bit more on the voting process here. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, two devices. This man's got two oh, devices. Okay. <laughs> so it's Eric. the machines voting. The machines are voting. You see how it makes things unequal. The guys with the more devices get more votes. <laughs> Smart voters will be better off. I'm going to declare that I can't declare a result on this because I don't think I'm confident in, in the system. But I think we've had a, a good airing of... of unless someone's going to persuade me otherwise. At the moment, Eric, I've got to tell you that it says against the motion, 51%, for the motion, 49%. That's statistically totally insignificant, but it's been going up and down, and as we've discovered, some people have got two or three devices, so they are skewing the vote. So I declare the vote irrelevant. Um, but on the other hand, we've had a very, very strong um, uh, airing of the discussion and the points. Five minutes each, and what we've done is get to the bullet point issues in a very efficient way in less than an hour. So can I thank you all very much indeed. And before you all go, Eric, what was it like being a smart machine at the other end and not traveling and flying 18 hours each way to take part in this debate? But what was it like? Well, could, you, could you get the I, sense of I, the debate? I have to be frank. I, I really regret I wasn't there in person. I think I would have enjoyed being able to uh, interact with you like a, a real human. So I, I don't think it's a, it's a substitute. On the other hand, being able to travel from Boston to China at the speed of light does have its advantages. Uh, I know how uh, much wear and tear it takes on my body when I do it the, uh, the old-fashioned way, the way they used to do it back in the 20th century, and uh, that's, a, that's an advantage. All right, Eric. Well, thank you very much indeed. Don't fall off the platform when you leave. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, be, be, uh, be safe as you drive through the streets of Cambridge later on tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all very much indeed for the preparation of the speeches as well. Thank you.